Wherever you are and wherever you may be on your own life's journey, you are welcome here at Sunderland Congregational Church, part of the United Church of Christ. We say that every beginning of every service, and we really do mean it. Whoever you are, if you're searching, if you're, fil you're really solid in your faith, whoever you are, you are welcome here. Whether you were here a hundred years ago at that first meal, or whether you are the first time ever sitting in one of these pews, we welcome you here. And so with that said, formal membership is not a requirement to join in our worship. But sometimes there are people that are moved to make a formal commitment, a formal covenant with the church. And that's what we're going to do now. And so I'd invite our deacons to uh, please come to, uh, forward. And this idea of a formal covenant is that we are here to support them and they are also here to support the church. And so if you have this... Uh, what is that, pink or purple? I don't know what color. Purple is gold purple. So if you have that in your bulletin, if you can take this out, because there are uh, some responses from the congregation. And with our deacons now here, I invite Jennifer and also Kelly to come forward. 
Uh, Jennifer is, is joining as an associate member. She already has membership in the Amherst Congregational Church, um, but is choosing to uh, join here as well as an associate member. And Kelly, also from Sunderland, is choosing to join as well. We welcome you both. So as I said, everyone is welcome here. Uh, but that idea of a covenant, a formal covenant between people and the church is what we have been doing since the boats were still offshore at Plymouth in 1620. So we are entering to a sacred tradition that is hundreds of years old to the very beginning of our nation. We invite to come forward those who wish to affirm their baptism by uniting with us in this particular household of faith, Kelly and Jennifer. By your baptism, you were made one with us in the body of Christ, the church. And today we rejoice in your pilgrimage of faith, which has brought you to this time and place. We give thanks for every community of faith that has been your spiritual home, and we celebrate your presence now in this particular household of faith. So do you promise to participate as best you are able in the life and mission of this family of God's people, sharing regularly in the worship of God and enlisting in the work of this local congregation as it serves this community and the world? I promise, I promise with the help of God. You memorized your part. Beautiful. <laughs> Let all who are able now to rise to welcome our brothers and sisters. So please rise. May we, the members of First Congregational Church of Sunderland, United Church of Christ, express our welcome and affirm our mutual ministry in Christ. The congregation, please. We welcome you to join in the eternal life of First Congregation. We promise you our friendship and prayers as we share the hopes and labors of the Church of Jesus Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, May we continue to grow together in God's knowledge and love and be ministers of our risen Savior. And now as pastor and the deacons, the spiritual lay leaders of this congregation, we say to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, and on behalf of the First Congregational Church of Sunderland, United Church of Christ, we extend to you the hand of Christian love, welcoming you into the company of this local congregation. O oh God, we praise you for calling us to faith and for gathering us into the church, the very body of Christ. We thank you for your people gathered in this local church and rejoice that you have increased our community of faith. Together, may we live in the spirit, building up one another in love, sharing in the life and worship of the church and serving the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now Judy, our clerk, has the uh, register book for our brand new members. Thank you very much. So with our congregation growing by two wonderful new members, let us now have our opening hymn in candle lighting, red hymnal number 157, In the Cross of Christ I Glory.
span of our earthly years and to live into the promise that we are created for eternity. Here Jesus is calling to us, calling us to come out of the tombs that we try to hold us within their power and control. The Spirit breathes new life into the dry bones that seem forever lifeless. God offers hope when things can seem hopeless. Our souls are waiting for the refreshment God offers. We are filled with the expectation of hearing Jesus' call to us. Jesus came as light to all in the world. Christ comes among us today in our shared worship to light the way forward. We open ourselves in our worship so that we may better receive Jesus, letting him abide in us without some fear. And now coming together as this congregation in person, via Zoom, and later via FCAT, our unison prayer. Savior of a steadfast love, bring new life to this community of your people. You are the breath of life. Breathe deeply into all of our souls. We open ourselves to hear your voice that calls us out of any darkness that entombs us. Fill us with your life-giving spirit. Share with us vitality and a motivating purpose. Energize and encourage us so that we may break forth from the darkness of our limitations and follow the light of all that you make possible. Give us the courage to unbind ourselves from the temptations and distractions that hold us back. Assure us that there are greater blessings awaiting us when we leave the darkness behind and walk toward your voice out in the light. Help us trust what we cannot yet see. Amen. flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, burning to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and the skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon me, slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore I prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you back up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. 
and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. So, is Sakura comfortable right there? Does she want to come up? Or. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So I was going to tell the kids, because I heard from the deacons, that on Palm Sunday, uh, the young kids are invited to uh, share the palms with the congregation. And I think that's a wonderful tradition. Uh, palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week. And this 52 weeks out of the year, that is the one that gets the name Holy Week. And it all begins with Palm Sunday. So Jesus has slowly but surely been making his way to Jerusalem. Uh, the feast, the Jewish feast of Passover is coming. And, and Passover is like July 4th for Americans. It's their day of liberation. It's when God set the, uh, the, the, enslaved Egypt, uh, the enslaved Jewish people in Egypt free through all of those miracles that Moses did. You know, the 10 plague story that you all talk about in Sunday school. And so Moses leads them out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, through the wilderness, and eventually they reach the Promised Land. So Passover is their story of freedom and liberation. And literally, people from out the Roman Empire, Jewish people from all over, you know, walking and taking boats or getting on, you know, animals, pack animals, somehow, maybe for weeks or maybe even for a month, they will travel to get to Jerusalem because that's where the temple is and that's where the, the offerings for Passover will take place and all these Jewish people are trying to get into Jerusalem for this, this great celebration. And Jesus is one amongst all of these people. But Jesus, just like Moses, is you know, this, this miracle worker. And, and Jesus has been doing all of these things that are starting to get people to think that maybe he's the Messiah, maybe he's the king. And they, they, as he comes, they, you know, there's no you know, uh, oak trees or maple trees. They cut down branches of palm. They lay them in the past so that Jesus is a sign of honor as he enters into the city on his donkey. And as they come, you know, the people are all yelling, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna is like, save us, deliver us. Son of David is that you are the king like David was. And so they have all these expectations that Jesus, like Moses on Passover, is going to liberate them, and this time from the Romans. And so there's all of that excitement. So we will bless palms that day. Everybody gets to go home with a palm. But by having those palms distributed by the children, that kind of excitement, them running around, you know, making all kinds of noise and stuff like that, that is to replicate the excitement of that first Palm Sunday. This idea that Jesus is coming and that there's this excitement coming into the city. And then, you know, those same palms, though, um, those are the same people that in a few days are going to say, crucify, crucify him. So those palms that were once a sign of honor, they also become a sign of false praise. That we want God to be what we think God should be instead of what God says, I am. And so there's a lot of stuff going on with Palm Sunday, and it all starts next Sunday, the first day of Holy Week. And I, I do hope that our children will come at that time so that we can share that joy and that excitement uh, that is Palm Sunday, which is only one week away. Holy Week is only one week away, and I do hope that our Lenten journey has helped prepare us so that it may be more meaningful to each and every one of us. And at this time, uh, the choir's anthem is just a closer walk with thee.
Thanks, choir. Thanks, Anthony, for that uplifting hymn. Talking about excitement. There you go. Beautiful. It is now our chance to, uh, to share prayers. And uh, before we get to the yellow sheet, we'd like to offer a couple, but we'd also like to mention that one of our prayers is for Grayson, and Grayson is with us today. It's very nice to see you, Grayson. So let us offer our prayers as we have been for Ukraine, uh, for the nation, for the people there. Let us pray for some way to uh, find peace in that, world, that part of our world. Let us also continue to offer our prayers for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. And so before we hit the yellow sheet, does anybody have any joys celebrate? Yes, Judy. Yeah. Did I hear something like 26 people had died? Yeah, so um, if you didn't hear what Judy said, uh, we're praying for the people down south um, who got hit by the hurricanes and the tornadoes, or the tornadoes, I'm sorry, and uh, 26 some odd people died, and there's the possibility of more today, so we keep them obviously in our prayers. Any other joys, celebrations, concerns? Yes, Reverend? Prayer for Roger's daughter and husband. Anybody else? Anybody at home on Zoom? All set? Okay. Then let us turn to our yellow sheet, and please remember we're just saying the first names. So let us pray for Alan, Alice, Antonia, and family, Art, Barbara, Bill, Bill, Bob, Bonnie, Carrie, Cheryl, Cindy, Denise, Evelyn, Frank, Grayson, Hayden, Jeff, John, John, Kathy, Martha, Mary, Michelle, Mike, Nancy, Paula, Pauline, Sandra, Cheryl, Steve, Thelma, Tim, Virginia and Richard, Wink, victims of violence anywhere in the world, those affected by natural disasters around the globe, and we pray for peace on earth. So at this point um, of sharing all of those prayers, may we turn inward for just a few moments of silence in the midst of our public worship to offer God those prayers that are just better kept a little bit closer to home. So just a few moments of silence. of all that is, that ever was, that ever shall be, we cannot live apart from you. Send Jesus to live among us now. Share the Spirit here to inspire us. Guide us so that we may be righteous in all our dealings with other people and responsive to you and wherever you would have us go. Help us to know the abundant life which you offer to those who follow Jesus' voice. Leave our darknesses behind, whatever it may be their cause, and follow into his light. Empower us to share this promise with both compassion and with courage. And we ask that you hear all the prayers that we offer today and that they may be answered as you alone know best how to do. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And may we now share in the prayer that Jesus has given to all of us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> God invites us to view the valley of dry bones that the prophet Ezekiel witnessed in a vision and which we shared as our first reading today. As God brought them back to life, may we experience that same life-affirming breath of God in our lives through what we do now, our worship. This opportunity to dwell in God's presence, free of the world's distractions, it is a blessing. So may we, through our support of this church, 
its worship, and its ministries help renew our lives and those of others as well. Therefore, may our contributions be as generous as our faith expects and also as our conditions in life allow, and donations may be made here in person or also by mailing them directly to the church. However you give, it is greatly appreciated. Accept, O Lord, these offerings now to be placed in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for all others. As we heard in today's first reading about that breath of God that brought new life to what seemed to be dead, as we will hear in the gospel about Jesus calling Lazarus forth from the grave, we should never underestimate the power of God to bring life and to renew that life wherever it is. And so as we give these gifts to God, we are offering them so that we may refresh ourselves here through our worship and maintain this ability to come together in this holy place. But it also helps us in our ministries to share that gift of hope and renewal with the world that I think is in desperate need of that life-giving grace that is Jesus. So thank you all for your continuing generosity and may God bless these gifts to his purpose, we pray. Amen. And our reflecting hymn today is Red Hymnal number 174, Throned Upon the Awful Tree.
We've been reading from John's Gospel recently, and John is different than the other three Gospels. He really is a storyteller. And so the other Gospels, you can break them up into smaller sections. With John, a lot of times it just can't be done. So again, this week, a rather long Gospel. This is from John 11, 1 through 45, the death and raising of Lazarus. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, and her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days long in the place where he was. And then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jewish people were just now trying to stone you, and are you going to go there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night, they stumble because the light is not in them. And after saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I am going there to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. And Jesus, however, had, not been, spe had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was only referring merely to sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with Jesus. And when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away. And many of the Jews had come out to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet will they live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, Mary got up quickly and went to Jesus. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews, who were there in her house consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out, and they followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Un Unbind him and let him go. And many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, they believed in him. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be accepted to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So Plato was a Greek philosopher from around 400 BC, 400 years before Jesus is born. He once tried to explain his philosophy, his way of, of thinking about the world by writing about people 
that he, and this is just his analogy, that were locked into a dark cave. And they were forced since childhood to sit with their backs up against a wall. So here's the wall, they're sitting with their backs there, and all they can see since childhood is the wall that is directly in front of them. Now behind the wall where they're seated against is a fire. And there are cut out images that along the top of the wall are carried along and they cast a shadow on that only wall in front of these people that they could see. And the people locked inside the cave, they believe that those shadows that were on the wall in front of them, that those shadows were reality because it was all that they knew. Now one person was freed from the shackles that locked him in place and he was dragged away from everything that was familiar. You know, it's to liberty, it's to freedom, but he's terrified because everything that he knew is being taken away. So he fought against his freedom, but he was dragged first to the other side of the wall and there was that fire burning, the one that was casting the shadows on the wall. And because he's only used to the shadows, the fire was really painful, like little needles going into his eyes because he was only accustomed to the darkness. And so then they drag him even farther and up and out of that tomb of the cave. And in the sunlight, as he gets out there, it's just so painful to see. And he just wants to go back down into the comfortable darkness of the cave. But slowly, however, his sight is able to adapt. And he could look at things away from the sun. So he's, he's looking down. He can see the grass. He can see like the, the little insects crawling through the grass. And he's amazed by all of this new revelation. And eventually... He was able at night to look up at the sky and see all those stars. He's able to look up and see the moon. And eventually one day he's even able during the daylight itself to look up and he sees the sun. And he's amazed and he's transformed. And, and now that he's realized that this is the real world and he was just seeing shadows, this is a good man. And he wants to return to the cave and free the others and share this news of a greater reality outside the cave. But as he returned to the darkness, his eyes are now accustomed to the light. And so as he goes down into the darkness of the cave, he can't see. He stumbles, he falls, he bangs himself around against the walls of this cave and he's injured. So he's got black and blue, he's bleeding, he's stumbling, he's hurt. And when he tries to tell the others about the real world out in the sun's light, you know, now he's standing in their midst and he's blinded in the darkness, stumbling and hurt and bruised and bleeding. They attacked the man because they did not understand his efforts were trying to free them. They saw that he was bruised and injured and they thought that he was trying to harm them in the same way. So they preferred their life chained into the cave because they were too afraid to believe in anything else beyond the shadows. And Plato, the philosopher, 400 years before Jesus, is trying to use this analogy to explain that there is a reality around us. It's obvious, but he thought that there was a greater reality beyond this one that is physical and sensory. And Plato is talking about a reality that makes this one seem like nothing but shadows. And John, he begins his gospel with the word, the word, and he calls it logos. And logos is a Greek philosophical term. And so John may very well have been aware of all of this stuff that Plato has been talking about. So is it fair to say that maybe a little bit of that cave story is part of this Lazarus story? And if it is, is it true that Lazarus, he is the only one that is literally locked into the darkness of the cave? Jesus is outside of the cave with all the other people around. But, you know, in the analogy, is it possible that they are also in that darkness, only seeing shadows? Jesus, in the midst of this crowd, when he invokes God loudly, he says, I don't need to do it. I'm doing it for their benefit. And so he does so in order that the others may hear his words and hopefully come to believe. And Jesus hopes through this miracle that they will be able to see beyond the shadows. And it's at this point that Jesus calls Lazarus out of the darkness. He's been in there for four days. He says, remove the stone. The sister says, Jesus, we don't want to do that. He's already got the stench of death. He's decaying. Remember, they're not embalming people back then. Four days, there's going to be a stench of death around my brother. Don't do it, Jesus. But Jesus orders them. He says, you got to believe. And so 
he calls out once the stone is removed. He says, Lazarus, come out of that cave. And out comes this once dead man wrapped in these burial cloths, you know, just like a mummy stumbling forward. He comes out into the light and Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. Now, what if that command is intended for more than the literal you know, take off those burial cloths, let him see, let him walk freely. What if that command of unbind him and let him go, what if that is meant for all the people who are around Jesus? What if it's meant to unbind us and let them go from all of those things that hold us back, that think that this is all that there is, that maybe it's just a, a child's dream or a fairy tale to think of anything beyond this. What if we're locked into this darkness of our shadows and Jesus says, unbind him, let him go? What if that's meant for all of us? Can it be that Jesus' call is for us to see differently, to see new truths, to see a greater reality? Well, let's talk about the two sisters, Martha and Mary. The Gospels share another kind of famous story about these two sisters. Martha is the one who's busy taking care of all the household duties. Jesus has unexpectedly arrived, and so Martha, she's you know, making dinner, she's tidying the house, she's setting the table, and Mary, her sister, just sat down at the feet of Jesus among the disciples as a disciple, and she's listening to the teacher. And Martha, going about all these things, she says to Jesus, Jesus, tell my sister Mary to come and help me. And Jesus says, Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be taken from her. So Mary is the one who's got this, this connection with Jesus, the teacher. She's sitting as a disciple. But now that the tables have been turned, and Martha comes running out when she hears that Jesus is approaching the village of Bethany, and she is disappointed in him. She complains to him, but ever so politely, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And that's the gentlest of rebukes, but still says a lot. But she, even though she's disappointed, she comes out to see Jesus. Mary hears that same message that Jesus is approaching. Mary, he, she ain't going to go. She's going to stay home. She's not only disappointed in Jesus, she's angry at Jesus. If Jesus hadn't spent those extra two days just waiting back wherever he was, if he had come, my brother would not have died. I'm not going out to see the teacher. So then... Martha playing the role of a diplomat. She tells a little bit of a white lie because it is not in the text, but she says to her sister, Mary, the teacher is asking about you. Jesus never says that, but Martha wants Mary to go out there. And so Mary gets up and she goes out to Jesus and she falls down at his feet and basically says the same thing as her sister. And she says, Jesus, you could have done something, but you chose not to. Martha comes out with this glorious statement about you are the Son of God, the long-awaited one who's coming into the world. Mary says, you didn't come when you could have. She's mad, and she's at the feet of Jesus in her anger. And maybe you've experienced this too sometimes. You know that, that anger that you have, and, and there's also a sorrow, and you're holding back those tears. You're not going to let those tears come out, but all of a sudden the tears break through. And so she's angry at Jesus, but then those tears break through, and Jesus looks down at this beloved woman, this Mary, who had sat at his feet listening to him as a teacher. And she, Jesus looks down, and, and maybe it's that she's angry at him combined with the fact that she's, you know, a little bit upset that he did not, a little bit, she is upset that he didn't come. And so Jesus looks down at her. And then you have that shortest verse in all of the Bible. It's nowhere else said in any of the Gospels. Jesus cries. You know, when they, hundreds of years later, when they break our Bible down into chapter and verse, this is the shortest verse in the entire Bible. And, and I have a Bible at home, it's just two words, Jesus wept. Uh, so those two words in 1135 in John's Gospel, they stand alone. No one else dares in the Gospels to see, say that Jesus cries. So Jesus cries with Martha and Mary and all the others. And Martha is disappointed. You know, Mary is disappointed and angry. Jesus cries. All these other people are standing around. They're transfixed by all this. Some are saying, oh, look how much he loved Lazarus. And others are saying, oh, why didn't he come earlier and save Lazarus? There's all this stuff going around. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is even the Son of God. There's all of these emotions, all these hopes, all these beliefs coming together. And then think about Jesus. 
He knows from the beginning, he says, that all of this is intended to glorify God and to help other people believe. He already knows before he left that Lazarus will be resuscitated. But the agony of those people around him, even though he knows that there is a greater reality, that they're only in the shadows, even though he knows that, it doesn't make the other stuff go away. All of these people so traumatized by the, 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 the fact that Lazarus is dead. And Jesus cries. And so Jesus cries, not like the others. The others are crying because they're crying for Lazarus. Jesus is crying with the ones who are crying because he feels our pain. So Jesus' command to unbind and to liberate, it, it's meant for Lazarus for sure, but it also, just like Plato's cave story, it's trying to liberate us, the ones who hear Jesus, and to help us to see beyond the shadows, to, to see that there is a world and a reality that is promised by God that is greater than the one we see. The ones who are locked in that cave, this was their world, and they said there's nothing else. And remember that bruised and injured man? They fought against him and despised him because they wanted to take him out of the shadows and into the light. Jesus is the bruised and battered man. Jesus wants to take us out of the shadows and into the light. He says there is a greater glory. But that whole time that Jesus knows there's a greater glory, we live in the shadows. Jesus knows what it is to be here, to be hurt, to be lonely, to be sick. You know, to have any kind of ache or pain or any kind of disappointment, Jesus knows. Because when he saw them crying, even though he knew he would draw Lazarus out of the tomb, Jesus cries. So we have a Savior who's telling us that there is something more. But while we're still here, Jesus understands and Jesus cries. In Plato's story, the ones locked in the shadows, they resented the freedom offered to them by the bruised and injured man, and they abused him further when, they, when he tried to free them. That's the story we're getting into with Holy Week. And you know, the U.S. Surgeon General just recently had a report. The young people are telling him that they feel they are being asked to chase certain objectives, getting a job with a fancy title, making a lot of money. If I make a lot of money, everything will be okay. Becoming famous and acquiring power. And not only did many of them say that all of this searching exhausted them, but they weren't sure that these things were really going to bring them happiness anyway. And this is where we have to pause and ask ourselves, because young people are telling the U.S. Surgeon General that the things that we hold up as so important in our world, they're just saying it's exhausting. So what are we pursuing if the young people are saying, I'm just exhausted? What are we imagining to be happiness and fulfillment that young people are just saying, it's exhausting? So after those kids told the Surgeon General, think about how the world reacts to Jesus' opposite teaching of selflessness and sacrifice for the greater good. Jesus is trying to take us out of the shadows and into the reality of his light. But will we fight that bruised and injured man and think that he's just trying to harm us some more? You know, it's like a fairy tale that, you know, you're just making believe. Or do we follow Jesus and really believe that there is something that makes sense out of all of these shadows? And that while we're here, Jesus cries with us, but Jesus promises us something greater. All of that is Holy Week. The whole mystery of the Last Supper. The whole unbelievable, ineffable love of the cross the reality of the tomb, and then that mystery and unexplainable, surprising joy that the tomb is empty. All of that is before us. We're in the shadows, but Jesus is taking us out if we will follow him. May we follow that Savior, and may we listen to his words and his vice, and may we realize that there are greater truths than what we have right now. And these things we pray for in Jesus' name, amen. And today's hymn of closing is from Blue Hymnal number 348, Softly and Tenderly. Uh, Anthony, how many verses? One. One verse. <laughs>
Thank you for coming out for our worship today. And please remember that Wednesday at 7 p.m. at the North Hadley Congregational Church is our last of the Lenten discussions offered by Reverend Koyama of the Montague Church. And that will also be online. And Judy has already sent out the link for that as well. And next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Um, I do hope you'll be with us. And if it's not too much out of your comfort zone, maybe extend the invite to somebody around you that may not go to church any other way without that special invite and invite them to come with you as we enter into Holy Week. So let us have our benediction and then move on to our congregational response. Our hope and prayer is that worship has freed us from whatever darkness may be restraining us. Refreshed by the Spirit of God, we are ready to break forth into the light of all that Jesus makes possible. Let us share this transformative gift of hope and light and life. Spread this promise, especially with those who are in distress. With Christ calling us forward, there is nothing to fear. Let us challenge our self-imposed limitations and break forth from them by following Jesus out of our darkness. So let us now go forth to love and serve the Lord in all that we do.